you know, you have very strong net profits. And right now, you know, you're at roughly around 300K in income and the year's not even over. When it comes to achieving good numbers, there's a million things that you can do to, to your benefit or detriment, but there's only one thing you can do to know which outcome you're going to have. I'm Brandon Lewis, founder of the Academy for Professional Painting Contractors. Joining me today is Devin Barnett of Renew Painting in Amarillo, Texas. While Devin has only been in business 3.5 years, he has grown quickly. By implementing systems and essential areas in his business, Devin has reached significant sales numbers, but more importantly, has very strong net profits. His customer list, crew size, and, and sales team are growing. Devin is the poster child for starting your business right uh, in a way that helps you get further faster. Devin, welcome to the program, buddy. Glad to have you. Hey, thanks, Brandon. I appreciate it. Um, yeah, glad to, glad to be on here. I appreciate everything you've done for our business. So yeah, thanks. All right, bud. Well, here we go. Uh, tell me a little bit about, I always <laughs> like to kind of start off, uh, tell me a little bit about your home life, you know, what, you're, what you do in your spare time. I think it's, it's intriguing. Yeah. Um, well, I'm married. We have a son who's nine. He's going on 25 right now. So um, yeah, it's it's something else. In spare time for us the past few months, there really hasn't been any because we went went from football. So football practice twice a week to football games twice on the weekends, two games on the weekend. We got one week off. Now we're in a basketball practice. My wife's coaching that. So we're doing basketball practice um, twice a week and two games on the weekend. So when when kids sports aren't taking over my life um i like downhill mountain biking um i uh i've, I've ridden motocross for probably last 10 years so racing dirt bikes the local tracks here in texas um yeah anything outdoors um that's what i'm into camping you name it well very good I'm, I'm, I'm uh I'm like you in in the broad i love everything outdoors uh however i, I do not know anything about sports nor do I watch it. And if it, if it uh, sounds like it's going to result in disastrous injury, uh, I, I'm not brave enough to do it anymore. Uh, mainly, uh, you know, other than perhaps drinking and falling down, which can be a contact sport, uh, depending <laughs> on how you do it. Uh, so you and I first met over uh, the phone uh, for a diagnostic back in March of really 2019. Uh, that you're engaged, you're about 32, you had uh, been in business a little over a year. Talk about how you got into the painting business, uh, where you were uh, in the process uh, as you and I spoke, because, you know, you had some industry experience and then you went out on your own. So, you know, just talk through that. Yeah. So this one's this probably be, uh, this would be kind of long. I'll try to make make this shorter than it than it really is. This is uh, this is going to go back to when I was 17 years old. So when I was 17, that's when I actually got in the painting business. Um, started working for a guy as a helper working uh, it was the summer of my junior year between my junior and senior year and it was supposed to be temporary but uh, I moved up pretty quickly from there and and I, and I worked my way into a leadership role pretty quick um, so I ended up sticking sticking there when I got out of school my parents about flipped when I said I wasn't going to college um, I gave them the whole I, I, I have had a entrepreneurial passion since I would say probably sparked with my freshman year in high school and so um, I gave her the whole speech about the Fortune 500 company owners and them, you know, Steve Jobs dropping out of college and, you, you know, all these guys that are, uh, I'm definitely not. Um, anyways, but I gave her that speech and said, I'll figure it out. And so I um, ended up becoming a project manager for that company and about, um, in, about a, in about a year and a half. And so that took me to Kansas City where I completed two 300,000 square foot retirement homes, an upscale high-rise apartment, living building, few apartment complexes. And during all this time, we're doing new, new residential painting as well. Um, after, after about three years of working for someone, I decided as a lot of us do, I'm gonna go out and do this on my own. I'm the one doing all the work, right? Have all the technical skills. So um, went out on my own. Now, I would not say that I was running a business. Um, looking back, back then, I thought I was running a business. Now, I look back, I was just merely self-employed. I didn't, I didn't know that at the time. Um, I was just excited that I had created something for myself. And 
it all it all came to an end at the end of 2009 when the housing bubble burst. Another thing I did not know at the time, but know now from studying the financial crisis of 2008. In a matter of about six months, I lost my house, uh, girlfriend of five years, business, vehicle, almost shirt off my back. So went from being on top of the world and, uh, kind of, you know, numbers wise, let's say I was 20 right at 21 and had um, in that in that first year doing that for myself and not knowing what I was doing had made right around $500,000. So for that age, I'm, you know, ex ecstatic. So I went from that to working as a welder's helper for $10 an hour. Um, and it was a very, and it was a dark time. That was definitely my low. And I spent about six months doing that where I, I, I gave up on entrepreneurship. I was just, I was like, I was done with it. I thought I was like, man, my parents are right. I should have went to college, should have got a degree. And I did. I ended up going back to school and I got my nursing license. Um, this was more out of fear than anything. You know, when I, when I decided what I was going to go to school for, I did it by, you know, what career is most needed and who will never be without work. And so that, I got down to nursing. And so that's where we go. Well, uh, worked that for a little bit and that wasn't for me, but so a lot of time in between there, we'll kind of skip fast forward to when I, when I spoke with you, I had just been in business about a year and was currently going through a, a transition of firing my largest customer, which was a new residential builder. Um, and I reached out to you, Brandon, because I've, I've learned in that time that we skipped, I spent a lot of time on personal development, reading books. Uh, man, probably 60 books before I even tried anything. Because the next time I got up on the horse, I, I wanted to have, you know, have some knowledge behind me. And so I reached out to you because through doing that, I learned it's a lot smarter and a lot cheaper to leverage other people's mistakes rather than making them myself. And, uh, you know, not, I'm sure you made a lot of mistakes and you got a lot of people's mistakes that you've seen. So that's, that's, you were being used, Brandon, but I appreciate it. Um, I, I've also learned that unless you're Steve Jobs or Elon Musk, you're probably not going to create anything that hasn't been done already and refined through trial and error. And that's timely and expensive. Um, so uh, I was really glad to, to find out that you shared the same thoughts in regards to new residential construction, because I, I turned down 500,000 in gross revenue uh, in 2019 which is more than we made all of 2018 working for multiple customers, um, which was crazy to me at the time, but it, it ended up freeing up all my time to work on marketing and sales for customers I wanted instead of just keeping the guys busy. Um, yeah. So, I mean, that's a, that's a lot. And I made a lot of mistakes early on. And if I had to start a painting business all over again, I would do it quite differently. And I have learned from hundreds of painting contractors, what doesn't work, what does work, what the guys will actually do, what they will not do, whether it is good for them or not. And so I focus on the things that give people the biggest, uh, you know, bang for their buck as early as possible. And, um, you know, I want to fast forward now to the day because when you and I got on uh, the phone the other day, uh, we had a conversation about commercial new construction. And um, I tried to tell you what I have learned just from you know, I worked at a, a vet for many years and there are breeds that bite and there are breeds that don't. And you approach them both differently because of past experiences and tetanus shots and trips to the hospital. And so same thing in business, uh, different markets do different things. So fast forward to today, because you've, you've only been back at this about three and a half years and yep. give, give our listeners an idea, kind of sales volume markets you serve, uh, services you provide, staffing, et cetera? Of course. Yeah. So sales volume, um, we're on target for, for 1.3 million this year. Um, and I can say that pretty confidently now that I, I track numbers daily. So um, we're on target for that this year. Um, our, our makeup right now is 85% residential repaint and 15% commercial repaint slash new commercial. I mean, it's, it's definitely on the smaller side. We had some contracts going into COVID with Benny, Keith, and some larger people around here that uh, they, that got wiped out during the COVID um, 
COVID thing. Hopefully we can get back to those at some point, but um, you know, the, the services that we provide are interior and exterior painting, uh, custom cabinet finishes. Uh, we, we recently started doing a lot of, especially this last summer lime wash. I don't know if, if, you know, if you've heard of that yet, but anyways, we got, we got, um, uh, labeled as the preferred pro, I reached out to Roma Bio and we got labeled as the preferred pro in our area for their masonry products, lime wash, mineral paints. Um, and then uh, we do minor drywall repair. We'll do some texture, you know, um, which that comes with the territory, but we don't do any large drywall. Um, and then some minor carpentry repair, repair, but all that makes up a little less than 3% of our business. We'll talk a little bit about, you know, the staffing because You've grown a pretty large staff in a very short period of time, and it's not just out in the field, although you do have them out in the field. So talk about, you know, how many painters you have in the field. Uh, you've recently ramped up your sales force. You've got a little operations or really a little bit of uh, admin help. Uh, so just tell people how you're structured right now. Yeah, so right now we have 14 painters in the field. Um, optimal crew size for us is around three people. Uh, we do have one float. We have... Uh, we, we do have a, a, a two man crew, you know, in painting, there's just, there's certain jobs that in order to be profitable on those jobs, you got to have the right number of people. Otherwise it looks like road construction out there. Um, mm -hmm. You know, two people watching one guy work. So yes. um, on the sales side of things, we currently have two project consultants in house. Um, we've had one for about a year and a half. The other one I hired about two months ago. So we're still going through quite a bit of training there. Um, as far as operations, operational management is a collective effort between um, the project consultants, myself and the office manager. Um, and I'll be honest with your with your project packets that we got from you. Uh, project management is a breeze compared to where it used to be when I ran things off the cuff. Uh, don't get me wrong. We still have the occasional hiccup, um, but it's very few and far between now, whereas before uh, that that first year just not having that in place was a nightmare. Um, but as long as you set expectations and let the guys know, hey, this is this is what I want from you out of this project packet and everyone that's new that gets hired on or gets promoted into a crew form of position, I will go through it with them and we will personally go through it the first 20 to 25 jobs just to make sure, hey, this is how I want this done. This is, and, and not just how I want it done, but how it's benefiting them. Because if you don't show how it's benefiting them, they don't care. They're not going to do it. And, you know, once you you get them to see that vision, man, it really helps on the project management side of things. Um, we recently hired an office administrator about five months ago, and she is a freaking rock star. Um, super pumped about her. She worked for a an HVAC company for 10 years prior to, to moving down here. And so she moved down here and the company that she worked for, they shared the same values. Um, they were really big on customer service and she shared those values as well. As well. So it's been uh, a really good fit and really freed up my time to work on the business, to work more on the business, um, which has been awesome. Well, and you're, I want to loop back on a point that you made about informing your people as to why processes that exist and how they are beneficial to them uh, having a little bit of structure and formality and using tools and templates in your business since in a painting business the same thing basically happens every time you do a project there's probably 80 percent of the administrative slash crew leader slash project management stuff is like the same every time and so if you don't codify it and if you don't make it simple then you know, it just really increases the opportunities to disappoint a client, for the painters to forget something and have a complaint that's unnecessary. And if you can uh, teach your people why it's to their benefit, instead of just, you know, trying to be a petty little tyrant, which is what a lot of owners try to do. And they just try to, this is my way or the highway. Well, that's great. And it may be your way or the highway. And in most cases it is, but you don't necessarily have to present it that way. Uh, to get people to act. Um, now, one thing that I'm excited about is that you you have very strong net profits. And right now, you know, you're at roughly around 300K in income and the year's not even over. Uh, you'll probably finish higher. And that's what we, we lock our guys to be at is 30% cash flow to owner. Uh, this is not a Baptist church. We, we do talk about money and earnings. 
Uh, not to say that you, you know, there's, there's always in the South, especially that like you can't talk about money as if it's it's something other than a, a representation of exchanging value. But uh, that just does not just happen. Uh, it starts with making money on every job. And it, it, you have 49% gross profits in residential, 58% gross profits in commercial. What systems, habits, and processes have allowed you to do that in the field? Because again, it all starts with the project. If there's no money made at the project level, there will be no money made anywhere else. Uh, that's, if this is going to sound scripted. It's not, but I really love that you said that on every project, because when it comes to achieving good numbers, there's a million things that you can do to, to your benefit or detriment. Um, we don't really have time to get into all that, but there's only one thing you can do to know which outcome you're going to have, and that's job costing. Um, prior to job costing, my, my year of hail, I call it, when I was doing new residential, I had no idea what our bottom line was. I was so caught up in the day-to-day -day and, and probably being that tyrant because I was on the job site every single day, every single job, just constantly harping on how we were doing the paint because I was a painter at first. So on how we're doing the painting and, and, and why we're doing the painting and where we're doing the painting and all that. Um, I can get back on track here, but I was so caught up in the day-to-day -day that I didn't know if we were making money. All I knew was money was coming in uh, to the commercial account and it was going out. Um, I was actually able to sit down at the, the end of the year and I'm really glad, I'm really glad I did, but I sat down at the end of the year and put together as best as I could without, you know, data, find out that our gross profit, and this is embarrassing to say, but our gross profit was around 23% uh, that year. Um, that's gross, not net. Mm. So basically I was paying enrollment to the University of Hard Knocks. And uh, as the saying goes, you know, you can't improve on what you don't measure. So don't use the excuse that you don't have time to do job costing because the reality is you don't have time not to do job costing. You want to look down after a year and find out that you work for free. Uh, it's not fun. As far as uh, processes go, I try to operate this business like a franchise. And, you know, probably most people have seen the Ray Kroc movie um, um, about McDonald's and that franchise or people are aware of it. And I, I try to operate that way. Um, just for us, we're a customer service business first. So, so I want to offer that same level of customer service every single time. I, that's, that's how we've grown our business. I know without a shadow of doubt, that's how we've grown our business the way that we have. And I, I want to keep that no matter what size we get to, that's going to be first and foremost. And that's not done by chance. You can't just, just cause you want, just because you have values as a company business owner, and just because that's what you want for the customer doesn't mean your people are going to want that. They got to know how to get there. And so, you know, it takes planning, it takes development of systems for how we do our estimates, how we kick a project off, how we close it out a project, how to follow up and take action when a problem does come up, you know, what are we going to do about it? Who needs to be notified? In short, everything we do right now is either, it's either a standardized system in the process of becoming one, or it's on a list that it's going to be done in the future. Um, just depending on when it comes becomes top of priority. So, and that's that's really important. In addition, some of the things, I mean, you have your crew meetings, you've used a save labor bonus program, you're using the ultimate crew leader packet, you've got job costing, you've got operational checklists. I mean, there's only a handful of things. It's almost like I look at a painting business like my 72 Chevy Blazer. It, it's not like today's car. You, 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 you can lift up the hood and you can point to things and know what they do. This is the carburetor. This is the power steering box. This is the battery. Whereas in a new car, it's so complex. Uh, you can't point to anything and really know what it is, nor can you work on it or replace it. But in a painting business, there's a handful of operational components, a handful of sales components, a handful of uh, admin components or marketing components. Now, there, you can make it as complex as you want to, but often I think people overly complicate it. If you just get the basics done, uh, there's a lot of grace everywhere else. If you don't get the basics done, there's no grace anywhere, <laughs> which is no good. Uh, talk a little bit about the sales process you use, how you manage your two sales representatives. Uh, so the prices um, are, are, are done correctly. So you know that you've got a winning job before you start it from a budget standpoint and so that you can get that proper hourly charge rates, so you can hit your 50 to 58% gross profits that you've been hitting uh, successfully. Yeah, uh, 
Yeah. Um, so we use we use the power paint soap process. We we use it front to back. There's not anything in there we don't use. Now, with that being said, I'll be honest. I did not use this until I hired my first salesperson. The reason why is I had the painting experience. I I did this. I know what it's like inside and out. I know how long it takes to roll out a wall, to roll out a room, to brush trim, to paint a door, to do cabinets. I've done it all. So that's all fine and good. But I realized that I could not teach my years of experience as a painter to someone who had never had painting experience. Both my salespeople, neither one of them have any painting experience. They never painted ever, not even their grandma's house. So, um, so I scratched everything I did to force myself to do that system. And it was all out of necessity of, just like I said before, I try to create a system out of everything. And I had to do something that I could teach and the power paint sales process I could teach. And, and it's, it, I mean, it's still better than what I was doing. I would say the reason why my closing rate is high. I stayed above 50% as a salesperson prior to this, but that was because of the confidence that I carried to know that I could solve any problem a customer had because I'd done it or seen it and knew what needed to be done. My guys don't, they don't know that. And if you're going to expand or you're going to grow, you have to have something in place that you can teach. And so, um, yeah, my salesman, they never painted a day in their life. And prior to a good example prior to Warner, my first sales guy, really learning the system. And it wasn't so much learning, it was embracing it. Cause I will say, you know, there's some of it that you got to get out of your comfort zone to, to be willing to talk to customers and ask customers uh, certain questions. And uh, we took his closing rate from 28% to right now, he's right at 51% for the year. Wow. So that is a huge. Huge. That is a huge difference. And from a financial perspective for you as the owner, like those little bitty metrics, I mean, a few percentage points can, can mean a hundred grand at the end of the year. Uh, That many is like a game changer. Exactly. I I told him, I said, Warner, uh, I mean, I like you, but I, I'm not going to be able to afford to, to keep you on, man. I can't afford to pay for these leads because I'm paying for these leads. This was at this time, he's not generating any leads. These are all mine. And, and I'm looking at them and, you know, I'm closing two jobs for every one that he's closing off the same lead. Um, I just couldn't afford it. And so, you know, we, we just went back to the drawing board and I'm going out to, you know, one of the things I wasn't doing in the beginning was verifying that they were doing what I asked. So going on these calls, um, because it is, you know, it, sales is nerve wracking. It's not so much that sales is nerve wracking, but when you're trying to remember a system and not sound scripted, it's, you know, it can get a little daunting and trying to remember all that. But I would do ride alongs with him until he got it down, until he got it down verbatim. And now he's confident and he still doesn't know anything about painting. He's learning more, but he's confident because now he knows a system that works. And before he couldn't believe the prices that we were asking, he was like, there's no way anyone's going to pay this. I said, you're not your customer. You're not selling to yourself. Quit, quit, get that out of your head, get that out of your mind. And a year later, he's closing $30,000 residential repaint jobs. Whereas before he was scared to ask for 5,000. So it's, it's been huge, but um, we have weekly sales meetings to make sure that they're meeting their, their key performance indicators. Um, you know, so which set for my company right now currently at, um, and, and we, we reverse engineer everything. So whatever our goal is for the year, we'll, we'll go back. Okay. How many jobs do we need to close? What does that look like? Um, but the big numbers for them is a closing rate of 50%. That's the biggest metric that I look at. Um, if, if, we're, if we're not at 50%, because I know that it can be done. Okay, what's going on? What are we not doing? What do we need to be doing? Um, and then the average job, job size of 4,300 and then 18.5 close weekly per salesman. So that's, uh, yeah, that's, that's, our, that's kind of our process in a nutshell there, which is- Well, you, you only need a few metrics per role. So it's the, you know, what I always say is, okay, number one, there's, there are metrics, right? What are the metrics you want? And you just, you just mentioned your, your weekly, you know, volume that you'd like, or or was that the monthly volume? Weekly. Weekly volume. You've got your close rate. You've got your average job size. Uh, And then I always say, well, what, what processes get people to that end metric? What processes? Okay. Well, now we've got to identify the process. A lot of owners, will identify, well, most owners neither identify the processes or the metrics or the outcomes for their people. They just expect them to be another owner, which they never will be. But 
if you if you define that metric, then you go, okay, well, how do I make this person get this metric? It's like if you give somebody a weight loss goal, well, there's diet and exercise components. You know, what kind of exercise are you going to do? How many calories are you going to burn? You know, what? How often are you going to be doing it? Uh, and what what type of food are you going to eat and at what time? And then you back up and go, okay, what's the process for that? Well, this is the process. Well, then you coach them to the process. And if the metrics aren't there, you go back and evaluate if the process is being used or not. And you just continue to reinforce that. And the ones that, that pick up uh, on it, you can keep. And the ones that, that, that don't, you, you have to release them to other opportunities. Another thing I was amazed at, and this is so interesting because it falls, it, rather it flies in the face of every industry um, misconception about how, how people buy painting services. And your repeat and referral numbers, given your company has only been in business three and a half years, which is your big numbers for that. Uh, no, nowhere near as big as some of our members that have been in it, you know, for six, seven years. But 28% of your business in, in 2021 came from repeat business. That's almost a third. And then 22% came from referrals. That means 50% of your business is already being generated by repeat and referral. And you're not like doing a hundred grand, you know, you're doing, you'll be doing 1.3 million. Um, and um, by the time you get through, when we had talked the other day, you're right around uh, 900, I think 30 something thousand. Uh, talk about, you know, how you were able to make that happen, but also, what happens to your business financially when those leads are, are generated from those sources versus net new sources? Um, yeah. So to hit on first, how, how to achieve that? Um, you know, I, this goes back to, to the customer service. Our core for focus is customer service. That's the, that's first and foremost, um, you know, painting, you know, professional painting. I, and I might've got this from you, Brandon. I don't know. I feel like I just say it to my guys all the time and I don't know where I heard it, but um, you know, our customers expect a professional paint job. That's why they hired us. They could have picked up the brush or the roller or, you know, you can even rent the spray rig if you want to, but they hire us because they can trust us. We're going to take care of their stuff. We're going to take responsibility. So first and foremost, you got to provide an exceptional experience to get that customer within your network. Um, and you, you, to make a lasting impression. Um, and that experience, it rarely comes from an awesome paint job. Uh, I can give a quick example. This recently just happened last week. Quick example. We recently completed a project for a customer that one of our guys dropped a gallon of paint down the stairs. Paint everywhere. So it saturated the carpet. We called in the carpet cleaners to come out and treat, treat that carpet. Um, this, it got the paint out of the carpet, but it didn't get it all the way out of the base fiber. So the carpet dried hard. And so I you know, got to have the difficult conversation. So I go out to the customer's home. I meet with the customer, apologize and tell her not to worry. We're going to replace the carpet. And that's what we did. And uh, while I was in her home, she said that she was hesitant to call us because she was afraid of how the conversation may go. And this is because our industry is known for not taking responsibility, denying, or even just not responding when things go sideways. She was so thankful that we were taking care of it, that she didn't want or need my apology. She, she said she would refer us without a doubt, and she's going to have us back to redo her kitchen after the holidays. Um, so owning up and taking responsibility when 95% of other contractors won't will set you apart. And I believe those experiences will be spread way more than an in and out job. And the paint job was good and, you know, nothing, you know, nothing su substantial about it. Now, with that being said, I don't care what you do. If you don't stay in contact, you will be forgotten. I don't care how good of a job you did or what experience they had. They will forget you. And then they're going to end up coming. It's happened to me. They'll end up coming back to a third party marketing platform. You're going to pay for them again. You're going to pay for this lead again. When they're already your customer, they already like you and trust you, but you didn't do a good job of staying in contact. So they didn't know how to reach you. Um, and then, so I, I use the monthly newsletters that, you know, that I know a lot of the members use. Um, those things. I know without a shadow of doubt that those work because I've had enough conversations with past customers that have asked me about them. They've asked me, they've asked me where they come from, like who, you know, some of them know, they know that, hey, we're not doing all that. Um, and so they ask like, oh, who does it? That's really cool. And they speak highly of them. It's cool to hear, but I actually had a guy take me to lunch. One of our customers take me to lunch just to talk about that. Um, he's not a business owner. So I know he didn't plan on using it in his business. He just wanted to talk about it. Um, <laughs> So I, I don't know what that was about, but, you know, 
what that does when you have 50%, which was actually 26% of our business came from referrals, but 20, you know, over 50% coming from repeat and referral business, you first, you have a customer that is not a first date, you know, you're not meeting a new girl and having to be introduced to the family and you're got to, you have to gain the trust and you got to be put on trial and you got to go through that whole process. They already trust you. Um, because it doesn't matter what you say, if they're hearing about you from someone that they trust, you you have their trust. And that that helps tremendously just with the rapport right out of the gate. Um, second to that is, you know, when you when you have that repeat business that you can rely on or not so much rely on, but, you know, you start to see that that's happening and that's increasing year over year. That's marketing you're not spending to make that bottom line. That's money you're not spending to go out and capture a new lead and date the new girl and, you know, talk to the parents and do all that, you know, per se. And so it's it's really, really big. Um, you know, and if you look at any, any industry, that's a huge metric that people look at is, hey, what's your re- repeat and referral business? Everybody wants to get above 50 percent. Except in painting, where it's well, never yeah. just. <laughs> Yeah, and that's just because we're, you know, if I was being honest, we're all done. That's what happens as painters. We just, just, I don't know. We just don't want to. It drives me crazy because even when I go to our industry conferences, I I feel like John the Baptist crying out in the wilderness and everybody's like, no, 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 buy them fresh. These are, it's not produce people, it's customers. You don't have to buy it fresh. Buy it old. The older, the vintage customers, in fact, are much better. Um, Yeah. And, and so, and, and actually in the same way, and, and like wine, customers in painting are like wine. You want them vintage and you want them old because they have money and they don't do it themselves and they don't haggle about the price. Uh, those are the best ones to have. And, you know, I would uh, jump off on that point that you made that you're a customer service business. Um, for some reason, people don't look at staying in touch with their customers after the sale as customer service. But if they don't have to, hunt for another service provider if they don't have uh if you don't put them at risk to have a bad experience with another painting contractor if if you help them remember how to stay in touch with you uh, and that's a service and if you get the added bonus of the fact that they buy from you and refer you to their friends that's a byproduct but you got to think about it you know uh, the farmer probably puts the fence around his cows primarily because he doesn't want to lose the investment, but he probably puts the fence around the cows to keep them from wandering into traffic or onto the interstate or injuring themselves or or being found in a place where they can't feed themselves. And so keeping your clients is, is, I would argue, is also a great service to them. So talk about a few other things that have helped you in their business, uh, like essential things like, okay, here's a couple of things that, that have been a big deal. What would they be? Oh, I, there's a lot um, from a core, just a court, let's say from a core principle as a person type of thing, you got to be humble. You got to accept that, you know, no matter how much, you know, you can always learn. Don't, you know, and, and just don't be that way. Don't, don't be prideful. I've been there where I've recreate the will. Sometimes I recreate the will and then I recreate it again because I've been so busy. I forgot I already recreated the will. And someone's already done it. And, you know, and excuse my French, but if I can be perfectly honest, most of us don't know shit. Um, I'm constantly seeking personal development through books, podcasts, other industries, business owners, groups, et cetera. You know, your group, I'm part of plenty of other groups. I go to um, a few leadership groups here in town. Um, That's the number one thing for me is just be willing to accept no matter how much you think you know you really don't and there's and it doesn't help you to know everything so just get that out of your head there's someone else doing it better than you um now the biggest thing for me is as far as from a uh, inside the business standpoint um it's probably it's, it's going to be numbers at first. And the reason why I say that is just going back, you can improve on what you don't measure. So getting your metrics down, knowing what you're doing, and then you can diagnose, hey, this is what I this is what I need to work on. Because if you if you don't have that, then you can't really just like going to the doctor's office, you know, you got to have some vital signs in order to figure out what's going on. And so that's one of the, the biggest things for me. And then other than that is just being being humble, being willing to learn. 
Well, I, I would agree with you on both of those things. Uh, when I first started my painting business, the first thing I did was, even though I could not find much in the way of painting business improvement information, the first thing I looked for, how do I build out a sales process? How do I run operations? I was always looking for somewhere, somehow that this had already been done. It took me about a year and a half to really get into that uh, it, as well as I should in numbers. Uh, when I get on my diagnostic call, like I did with you back in March of 2019, I often ask painting contractors about their numbers and they want to tell me about their feelings. And I'm like, no, what is this? I'm looking to, this is a numbers question. Well, I think that feel that, well, my buddy said, and I, we're pretty, no, this is a number. And they just, the numbers are not known. I mean, the numbers are not known. They, you know, they probably know the winning lottery numbers better than they know like the job costing numbers. And Absolutely. Uh, and that's the only way I can tell. Like you said, when you walk into the ER, they take a few vitals. I spend the first part of my diagnostic taking, you know, really big vitals. And then we get down to the smaller things, just like a physician does when you go in with an ailment. They always, you know, start with your weight. They start with your blood pressure and a few other things and your, you know, oxygen level, your heart rate. Uh, and, and then they move on to, well, let's, let's run some tests on some other things. Um, and, and humility is, I'm, I'm, I've quit looking for, uh, ways to reinvent the wheel. Uh, I've got some great people that I work with on various projects and uh, I try to go find out an expert and you may have to go through three people to find the one that's actually really good, but you've got to be willing to hunt. So to close out, if you were talking to the painting contractor that was in your spot the first time you started, or maybe even the first year that you were in business or you're uh, overwhelmed uh, maybe you've lost some confidence that that you are built for entrepreneurism. And I've, I've done that before, too. I've stepped in a, a couple of big piles in my entrepreneurial uh, career. So tell me a little bit about that and, and what you would say to them. Um, well, just to, this really goes with the last question you said, you know, and I and I think about it and you saying that you looked for sales processes and you looked for these different systems. I'm super impressed by that because I, I didn't, and I don't know why, I don't know why I didn't think that that information was out there. So, you know, just to repeat what I said earlier, seek help. Very few people figure it out on their own, you know, very few people as a small business owner figure it out on their own. Um, we all know the small business closure rates. They're, they're horrible. Most never even make it to five years. You know, and when you hear that number, you're like, man, why would I ever even start a small business? Well, you know, I don't I think that number is heavily, heavily skewed because most of those people were just like me to first go around. They weren't business owners. They just bought themselves a job. They never took the time to learn their craft, you know, to treat it just like you would if you were in the trade itself as a business owner. Take the time to learn the craft. It is a craft. It is, you know. But learn from others who've already blazed the trail. Uh, like I said before, there's people who's already done this and they've done it better than you. And that's part of being humble. Just accept that. You're not going to do it any different. When it comes to the service industry, there's, you're offering a service for money. There's not really any secret sauce. It's just do a good job. Do it, Say you're going to do something and then do it. Um, and put those systems and processes in place to make sure that everybody working around you can accomplish that. But, um, you know, business ownership is one of the hardest things you'll ever do, but if you do it well, it will be one of the most rewarding things you'll ever do. Amen. You can go a lot further, a lot faster, and uh, you can do a lot of things that you'd never be able to do as being an, an employee. Uh, it may keep you up at night and you may have a little bit more acid reflux from time to time. But uh, in the end, when the dust settles, it's definitely worth it. Well, Devin, Bud, I appreciate you being here with me. This has been very good. I can't wait to get it out. Uh, thank you again for your time. I know you're busy. Yes, sir. Thank you. All right, guys. Well, I hope you all enjoy the program. Uh, Devin is the reason that I do this at the APPC. It's the motivation that I, keeps me going. I love working uh, with men in this industry. We have, have a lot of wives and a few ladies, but uh, working with the boys, I get to do it every day and it's really fun. I'm proud of what you have accomplished in a short period of time. And I'll be honest, you should be too. Um, and you probably can really appreciate it uh, at this point. Uh, Brandon Lewis here with the Academy for Professional Painting Contractors. Until next time, I'm signing off. Thank you.